have with us Sharif and Musa uh, uh, to present on flawed landscape poems from 1987 to 2008 and other readings, which is the, the title of this uh, uh, publication, uh, this book here of poetry, um, and also to speak about uh, Seeking Palestine, New Palestinian Writing on Exile and Home. Uh, we have copies of these um, uh, books uh, available um, uh, in, in the back, and I'm sure Sharif will be uh, happy to uh, assign those as well for those who are interested in uh, purchasing them. Um, Sharif will read poems from his book, Flawed Landscape, and from uh, two unpublished manuscripts, and he'll also discuss Seeking Palestine. Um, the book is edited, uh, Seeking Palestine, by Penny Johnson and Raja Shahadeh, and he will consider in the discussion whether there are circles of exile, uh, that is, does or how does the place of a Palestinian residence affect one's relationship to Palestine. Uh, Sharif al-Musa is a poet, scholar, and translator. Apart from his academic publications, he's the author of Flawed Landscape and co-editor of the anthology Grape Leaves, A Century of Arab American uh, Poetry. He also holds a PhD from MIT and is a visiting researcher at Georgetown University. So we're very happy to have Sharif with us today to talk to us about Flawed Landscape and other poetry. What I will do today is I will divide the time I have into three portions. Uh, one, to reflect on the book, uh, Flawed uh, Seeking Palestine, which I hope uh, we wanted to have it at one point projected uh, on, the, you know, on the screen because I will be talking about the cover uh, a lot, actually. Uh, seeking Palestine. And the second portion is I will read my poems, and the third one is uh, Q and A. Uh, seeking Palestine is an anthology of memoirs, and I have always advised my students uh, when they do book reviews not to review anthologies because by the time you mention every author and uh, the title of their uh, article, uh, your 2,000 words are over. Uh, but here I am uh, unwisely disregarding uh, my advice to my students and talking about an anthology. So um, the contributors to the book are all accomplished writers, scholars, and poets, many uh, of whom you know, and some of them were here. The editors are Rajesh Hadi and, and Penny Johnson, and they came here. We have Layla Abu Lubud, we have uh, Bashara Dubani, we have uh, uh, Suzanne Abu Hawa, she was here. Uh, uh, and I will be mentioning uh, other people as we go along, but they are all uh, a, an accomplished set of, of uh, people. And I'm very proud, uh, you know, very privileged to be uh, one of them, uh, of the contributors to the, to the anthology, and also to present it uh, uh, today. Uh, <coughs> they have grown up and lived in many countries and cities, witnessed many traumatic events and otherwise. They got maltreated at airports and checkpoints, and so each focuses on a moment, a place, a person, an event, and spins their memoir uh, around it. Layla Abu Lubud traces what she calls modestly her father's political education. Her father, in fact, was also a political educator himself. Uh, Rima Hamami uh, locates her story in the genteel neighborhood uh, of Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem, uh, getting uh, menaced and then colonized by Jewish settlers. This is really, it, uh, if you read it, you kind of can uh, get a sense of what happened in other parts of Jerusalem and what is happening today. She gives a chronology of it in a very uh, dark, dark humor. It makes you almost like cry and laugh at the same time. Uh, at the same time, it, I highly recommend reading that one. Uh, Jean Saeed uh, Magdesi dwells on the village of Dor uh, Shwer 
uh, in Lebanon, where she uh, has lived for many years and experienced civil and other uh, civil wars in that country. Rajesh Hadi trains his eyes on the mutations of the Mukata, the compound that uh, now houses President Abbas, and that was originally a British jail, and then where this is where Arafat was besieged, if you recall. Um, and, and he focuses on that. Rana Barakat dialogues with Edward Said on home and exile and so on and so forth. I can't mention all of them. Okay. So what I will do is uh, I thought I will follow their in their tracks and use for the rest of my talk the cover of their book, the Im uh, of the book, the image and the title. I'll focus on a place too because otherwise, you know, I, I will get lost and you will get lost. So <coughs> what do I find in, in this image? Uh, this is the, they didn't uh, project it? Okay, you, you see it, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a familiar image, right? I mean, okay. Uh, the, the, uh, the image which evokes the ancient uh, Greek myth of Ariadne is striking in both composition and colors. The image is by Palestinian artist and filmmaker Emily Jasser. In it, the Palestinian Ariadne, if we can call this Palestinian uh, Ariadne, uh, uh, sits on top of the rubble of a house uh, with twisted bars which is a perennial Palestinian image from 1948, the destruction of hundreds of villages to just the recent carnage uh, in, in, in Gaza. Uh, she pretends to be knitting and is looking away as, as if she cannot really bear the gravity of the sight, when in fact she is imagining, plotting, waiting to deliver the ball of red yarn to Theseus, who is negotiating a maze and dealing with monsters. Ariadne was <coughs> a goddess from Crete, and historically, the Philistines, one of our ancestor tribes, were probably refugees from Crete, who, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, settled between today's Jaffa and Gaza City. Emily Jasser and her sister, Anne-Marie Jasser, whom you, she is also a filmmaker and, uh, and, and a poet, uh, have co-founded Philistine Films. So here we have origins and Philistine authors, which is not to suggest that the conflict with Israel is as old as the hills, far from it. it the conflict is recent and a hundred years old only. Uh, the book itself has been going through a maze. First, it was put out by a publisher in India, Women Unlimited, it is called, the first feminist uh, press in that uh, country, thanks to the dedication of the publisher Ritu Menon. Then it was published in Australia and subsequently it was picked up by the tireless Michelle Moshebak of Interlink. And this is the copy we have from Michelle Moshebak. Uh, <coughs> uh, I understand also that the book is being now uh, uh, translated into Spanish in Argentina. Uh, so the book has become a kind of Theseus uh, negotiating the labyrinth and helping in the battle against the monstrous tale about Palestine and its people that we are all familiar uh, with. Uh, Theseus in the Greek myth was tasked with the unification of Attica under Athens or in Greek, uh, what they call in Greek, making them dwell together. The anthology is a communal act, a dwelling together, 
in the dual sense of dwelling. Dwelling together is vital for Palestinians, for one of the aims of Zionism and Israel has been to fragment us and not to acknowledge us as a people to start with. In a sense, these communal memoirs are a way of resisting fragmentation. Dwelling together is also significant in these Palestinian times, which Karman Abulsi, who is one of the contributors to the, to the anthology, likens to the phase uh, of lostness and seeming absence of purpose uh, in the aftermath of 1948. Uh, after the Nakba in 1948. Um, uh, here I should mention another anthology in press with about 100 contributors that titled Being Palestinian. It will come out of Edinburgh University uh, Press hopefully this year, it's like uh, each one contributes about 1,300 words. It's, uh, it's modeled after another antho uh, two anthologies. One is being Irish and one is being Scottish. And it has people from all walks of life in it. So this is another uh, anthology with many Palestinians uh, in it. Seeking Palestine is not about the pursuit of happiness. Or if it is about such a uh, coveted commodity, then it is like the happiness of uh, the poet from uh, Nazara, uh, Nazareth, uh, Taha, Taha Muhammad Ali, if any one of you uh, know him. He's not very well known. A happiness which he described, a happiness that bears no relationship to happiness. That kind of, you know, you can write a book about that. Uh, just if, if he only, I thought, said that sentence, it was enough for him to say, my happiness bears no relationship to happiness. I could observe in the memoirs how one holds one, one, the one's bearing, oneself, while living in abeyance. As Darwish said in his poem, eulogizing Edward Said, you are from there, and from here. You are neither there nor here. Not only the writers who live outside Palestine feel they are exiled, those who live inside share the feeling. This is what Raja Shahade tells us as he feels, uh, 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 that he feels as he watches his hiking, uh, uh, Raja is a hiker and he wrote this book, Palestinian Walks, and uh, he saw uh, a lot of the tracks he was hiking on being blocked by Israeli settlements, which kind of, you know, made him feel like he himself uh, became an exile. I mentioned Rima, who also, has the title of her article is about being an exile in Jerusalem because of the marginalization of the neighborhood uh, also by uh, uh, Jewish uh, settlement. I must confess, though, that at times I want to send a gentle reminder to my friends who live in Palestine and feel exiled. I want to tell them, please, leave exile for us, those who live outside. You can't have everything, my friends. You know. So I hope they... Listen, but these memoirs may not qualify as successful memoirs, which are, according to the Croatian writer Dubravka Ujrašik, I think this is how she pronounces his name, a confessional genre uh, about abuse, sexual or physical dependence on substance or another, uh, some egregious uh, sin, death of a nearest one, and the overcoming of these. Successful memoirs are about achieving serenity, wisdom, harmony, and spiritual purification. There is some of that in Seeking Palestine. Nonetheless, the most distinguishing feature of these memoirs is that they are political memoirs. 
By political memoirs, I do not mean uh, politicians writing uh, their memoirs. What I mean is that these are narratives about lives that have been permeated by uh, politics. In the 60s, uh, in the United States, there emerged the idea uh, you know, from among uh, feminist circles that the personal is political. In the Palestinian case, and I suspect for many, you know, for the bulk of humanity, the political is personal. So when you want to narrate your life, it t the p politics is so much a big part of it. You cannot avoid it. Of course, if we look at the Arab world today, you know, everyone is uh, being plagued uh, by politics. Politics is good if you uh, occupy the higher uh, rungs you know, of the political ladder. Uh, they are not good if you are uh, low. This is why most utopias always envision the elimination of politics. You know, uh, the elimination of politics means the world has really reached its utopian uh, end. In these memoirs, memory is central to the stories. Both the historical memory of the Palestinian people and the individual memory of the author. The struggle against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting, uh, wrote Milan Kundera in his book, uh, The Book of Laughter and Forgetting. The Zionist movement and Israel have written a totalitarian history of Palestine, Israel, that received daily updates on CNN and Fox uh, News and other media. I do not overlook here the courageous and honest Israeli historians who have written otherwise. The author's memories are a witness against the false history written by the victim. If the writers look back, it is only to look forward. These are not memoirs of narrow or chauvinistic nationalism. They are stories of individuals who have experienced exclusion, maltreatment at borders, civil wars, and their journeys open them to others. For them, Palestine is a cause of human freedom, and they seek not only to recover the past, they desire also to liberate the future. In the end, seeking Palestine is about keeping the promise. For only by having and keeping a promise we can we maintain ourselves, our identities. And to do that, the authors show us how they had to fight or they had to fight many monsters, both from within and from without. Dare I say, enjoy the read. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so <coughs> what I'll do next, I will read uh, uh, my own poems. Uh, appropriate to the occasion, what I will do is uh, read a poem called uh, Story of the Olive Tree and dedicate it to uh, Sharon uh, Al-Qasim, uh, Samira's mother. Um, uh, this, the, this, uh, uh, this poem uh, is, uh, is, not, uh, is not in the book. It's in, uh, uh, an anthology, uh, is in a manuscript that I have written mostly in uh, while I was in Doha. Uh, this is uh, it's very interesting, despite everything, you know, like all the, the transformation, the metamorphosis that took place in the Gulf. Once you are in the desert, a lot of my Arab 
kind of history and memory somehow was there in, in a state of conflict, of course, of what is going on now. But yet I wrote you know, poems about camels, about this, about everything, uh, which I couldn't really r write uh, elsewhere. In Cairo, I was kind of enmeshed in the moment and maybe in ancient Egyptian history because that also is very seductive kind of uh, history. That once you get into it, you really can't come out of it. So the story of the old tree really started uh, with lines from my grandmother, which, you know, I mean, she told them to me many years ago. And I always kept them in my mind. And I felt like they, they are a gift that I should do something with. You know, I just couldn't leave them. And so this is the poem. It will be, the poem will be published in um, the Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Review. Uh, is a literary journal that comes out of the University of Amherst. And uh, it is uh, in an issue uh, devoted to Mediterranean poetry. So, you know, I'm discovering that I am also a Mediterranean uh, poet here. <laughs> yeah. in, in, in Egypt, I used to say I'm Palestinian by birth, American by citizenship, Egyptian at heart. Now I will have to add and Mediterranean by temperament, but, <laughs> but okay. So the, the, the poem, <coughs> the sto story of the olive tree. When the prophet died, my grandmother told me all the trees shed their leaves in mourning, except the olive tree. It was there for all to see. The Lord himself was displeased. Wary of his imperfect creatures, he reckoned he had to act fast, lest heresy infest the earth. The first move, in accordance with the law, was to obtain the confession of the tree. As he mulled over his options, a head angel sensed his mood, rose instantly out of the crypt, and beat its wings four times in the four directions, signaling it was keen to do the job. The day was clear. The sun let the soil, paternal rocks, and human dwellings recover their colors and shapes, which the night had replaced with its own. Everything was visible except the angel. It had landed in silence like a secret thought next to the olive tree. After positioning itself, the angel scanned the strange form, foliage and roots. It wondered how the old misshapen trunk could spawn such brilliant leaves or why if she had regard for the peasant soil would the olive tree bear a million small fruits? Suddenly, an itch on the back reminded the angel. It was an angel, not a judge. Mortified, it scratched the guilty spot and, in matter-of-fact voice, as the unsuspecting tree. Why aren't you grieving? Why haven't you shed your leaves? The olive tree kept calm. The gentle swaying of the branches was from the urging of the breeze. I am heartbroken. I am more heartbroken than the rest, but my sorrow burns green. It burns inside, she replied. When the angel relayed the message, the Lord was relieved. Shaking his head in approval, he said, he himself often burned inside. Otherwise, the world long ago would have been set on fire. <coughs> okay, what am I going to read next? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll go to the book now and uh, uh, 
this is a poem I wrote a while back, uh, an epitaph for a mass grave in Sabra and Shatila. Uh, all of you know the right, the, the massacre. Okay. Our defendants left us, our defenders left us after we had been promised safety. But we were gunned down, bludgeoned by axes, hoes, by nocturnal cowardice. Mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, the bulldozers hurled us all into this vast dug hole hurled us all at once. The earth was so dumbfounded it could not say enough. We lie now like all the dead in vast repose. When you come by, please say a prayer. Then keep quiet. Keep quiet. Uh, I read another poem from uh, the refugee camps. I grew up in a refugee camp in the West Bank of Jordan, so I am naturally uh, affiliated uh, with these. This, this is where the, the, the title of the article, uh, of the book came from, uh, the kind of the site of the camp. I describe it as flawed landscape. So. That is, but this one is not about that. This one is uh, uh, a little piece of uh, sky, which is page 66. Okay. Marveling today at the safe ways abundance of tuna fish cans, I thought of my friend Hussein. He was the genius of the school. He breathed in history, grammar, math as easily as the dust of the camp. He had the pyramid school. Books would have sprouted from his head, but he had to live, and to live, he apprenticed with a carpenter and later on flew his skill to an oil country where he made good as a contractor. His father had been killed the spring he was born in a war that made us refugees and tossed us on the moral map of the world. His mother was a woman of meager means, could look at a word for a year and not recognize what it was, and so it was. Poverty wagged him every day. One afternoon, I met him walking home from the store holding with his thumb and forefinger the upright lid of a half-open tuna fish can, humming a tune about, about holding a little piece of sky. Mm -hmm. uh, the next poem is about Gaza, which is the huge refugee camp. I was in Gaza in 1997. I went supposedly to assist the Ministry of, uh, of uh, Planning with the drafting of the Palestinian, first Palestinian development plan, kind of really first reconstruction in a way. We keep hearing about reconstruction. That started uh, in 1997. Uh, and I, I took notes there, you know, and after I came back, I, I wrote a poem. The poem is, uh, some of it is like regular poetry with broken lines, and some of it in prose, kind of prose poetry. Uh, the, the, the prose parts are about borders, about Israel and the borders. Uh, the others are about inside Gaza. So I won't, five minutes, wow. Uh, okay, so uh, I won't, I won't, uh, you know, uh, read all of it, but some of it. Uh, uh, 
moons and donkeys. Gaza is a cage. Barbed wire on inland side, on the inland side, the sea mostly of limits. No mountains, no valleys. The place is flat. Forget about movies, books, and bars. The war is set to be over. The price paid and will be paid further. A torpid peace is settling in. What were the prophets smitten by? I am told the yellow finches perch on the fence. Consider, smell the rampant sewers, then wing back to the desert. I go around like an ancient Chinese poet watching moons and donkeys. After weeks, after weeks, the spirit corrugated like the rooftops in the refugee camps. My feet walked backward like the feet of the shoeless children. At dawn, the Muazzin's megaphones clash overlap, each spurred on to call us louder and louder for prayer to amplify to God our impotence. The ash-colored donkey was pregnant and flaunting it, bellyful hanging low like the night's moon. She stepped into the road slowly, deliberately, then bolt, turned her head this way and that way. All the honking fell on deaf ears. I watched from my stopped car this smock checkpoint, this street theater. I want, I want to cross borders unseen, like salmon, like contaminated wind. Scores of fishing boats spread out of the meager port. In the depth of the night, their kerosene lamps and oases of lights, soft yellow, a beauty hard to conquer or resist. The fishermen doze off and draw again. A daily summer ritual, Wed a wedding motorcade in the late afternoon, a few cars for the lucky ones, a bus and a pickup truck or two packed with young boys who laugh and dance, clap and sing, like birds singing to make themselves visible in the cage. Uh, okay, let's see. okay I'll, this one, <coughs> this is my last uh, poem, I will read it. This is uh, from uh, the Cairo uh, manuscript. It doesn't really kind of maybe evoke a lot of Cairo, but there is Cairo in it called Hanging the Clothes. Uh, uh, when my son and I, you know, were, uh, we, we would do the wash and then hang the clothes uh, because the, uh, we don't use dryers in Cairo because it's, you know, sunny. And uh, however, men are not, you know, really don't do that uh, in the Arab world. You don't stand on the balcony as a man. And so there was, you know, some story there. And I started with the line, with the, the first line uh, uh, mentions uh, Nut. Nut is the, the sky goddess in Egypt. The, 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 god, the sky god, uh, the sun god is, is, uh, is Ra, right? Ra, and he, every day he transports, you know, the, the sun disk to her through the sky without honking, you know, in Cairo you will see here, but he doesn't honk the whole time. Uh, and he delivers the disc, you know, and she takes the disc and it goes through her body. There is a beautiful uh, 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 drawing of her in, in the 
in the valley of the kings, uh, beautiful, w with, the, with the sun kind of dropping through her body until she <coughs> gives birth to her in the morning. So this is where I start. Newt has delivered another day. The electric meter and toilet flush are in working order. I am linked by long cables and pipes to the great circuit of the world. It's midday, Friday, and I'm doing the wash. I observe the machine spin the clothes with the same punk punctuation, same gusto of a hundred times before. I hold them in the bucket to the clothesline. I hide behind the lush tree across from the balcony so no one could see me, a man savoring the colors, the fresh scent of the emergent garments as if he hasn't seen them, seen them in years. If my father were alive, he would now be at the mosque reciting the same words, or are they, uttered aeons ago in the Arabian desert, listening to the preacher spin the immutable sermon. He would come back home, tell tales about the prophets and disciples, and grin giddily at the end of each tale as if he were in their company just yesterday. Now my mother appears, standing across from me, pinning down my shirt with her small, accurate hands. She looks at me, her eyes dripping like a soaked dress, as if weeping from her whole body, as if I had fallen into the Iron Age. See, had you stayed with us, you wouldn't have had to hang your own clothes. Okay, mother, now I need to dry the clothes and your tears. Once more, your love short circuits everything. But I pin down my tongue. She's my mother, and today is the Sabbath. Instead, I say, mother, could we just sit down for a few minutes and listen to father finish his stories? She turns her back, and father follows without a goodbye, a couple of illusions, each to another world, leaving me in wait for the next load. I think I will stop. Most of the poems that uh, you were reading were melancholic, sounded melancholic, at least to my yeah. ears. So, but it, it, I could say that it is understandable. So, I, which made me wonder whether uh, Palestinian poets or you also write cheerful poems. Thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, I have many. <laughs> <laughs> But today was, you know, especially because also the, uh, uh, the death of Samira's mother, and uh, uh, we had Gaza, we have Jerusalem, so the atmosphere is a bit melancholic, and I prefer to write these. But I do write. Uh, but even, you know, I think what, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, uh, you ev in the middle of this melancholy, you try to laugh, you know, because that's the only way to really. Uh, uh, fend off the tragic. I mean, in Shakespeare, there are always these gestures and characters you know, when everything is coming, you know, uh, the roofs are coming down, everyone is in trouble. So this, you, we try to overcome it with humor. It's, it's witty, uh, wittiness. I mean, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's usually dark humor. So even in the middle of this, I thought in, in the Gaza poem, I mean, you know, I thought it was a little playful, there were moments in it, right? I mean, uh, even with my mother here, uh, when you are telling her, you know, uh, your love shirt, 
short circuits everything you know come on but it, there is a playfulness here i think in so it is it is not uh, you know like uh, depressing really poetry i hope n not i mean poetry is not meant to depress it is meant to elevate uh, it uh, when uh, i uh, even i wrote recently a poem in jadalia kind of about the arab spring and um Although, I mean, there are very gruesome things in it, but also th there are other things also that uh, come in, you know. And in it, I said uh, one, one kind of short, almost like a haiku, uh, poetry is not a weapon. It does not <coughs> aim at closure, but at disclosure. So uh, poetry opens up. You know, always. So even with my like this uh, last poem, I'm not trying defending my poems or anything. Uh, I mean, they, they my the parents go back, you know, to their world, uh, and I am continuing my labor for the next load, whatever the load is, right? So it is not. I didn't, uh, you know. Uh, fortunately, they didn't take me with them. <laughs> So uh, you have to be careful in your dream that your parents don't take you with them. But <coughs> Thank you very much. I enjoy the poetry very much. And as an Arab American Egyptian, a lot of it spoke to me. I just wanted to know if, uh, I assume you speak Arabic, if you think in Arabic and translate, not to ask too much about your process. And then the reference to the prophet, not that it matters, but is it Sayyidina Muhammad or Sayyidina Isa? And then the third question was, um, and also not to ask too much about your creative process, but the lines from your grandmother, um, were, could you tell us a little bit about the story that she told you about the olive tree? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, you asked, I mean, the first question is, uh, of course, a perennial question. We, people who write in their non-native language are always asked this question. And uh, it is a very good question, and it has many answers. None of them, I think, is probably at the end uh, satisfactory. Uh, the easiest way to think about it is that you, you, know, you can learn languages. People, we, we learn one language, two or three. Not only uh, this language, but we learn a lot of other. We learn the language of science. We learn the language of the plants. We learn the language of all sorts of things. So I think at one point, this is how I put it, uh, instead of yeah, having my mother's tongue right in, in my mother's tongue, now I mother my tongue. I'm old enough to mother my tongue. And uh, so that is how you know, I think about it. There is a very nice, uh, uh, a nice line from uh, a poem by C.P. Kavafi. Kavafi you know, uh, uh, was an Alexandrian Greek poet, and he really lived in Alexandria, but all his poetry about an imagined Alexandria during the Hellenic uh, period. So, but he addresses a figure who obviously lives uh, in, in Egypt, and, uh, 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 and he, so he, he feels Egyptian, right? So he tells him, poor uh, your Egyptian feelings, in the Greek you use. So, you know, you can pour your, uh, because he himself was pouring his Egyptian, although he was, you know, kind of Greek in Alexandria, but all, all, all your life you are in Egypt. So he was pouring his uh, Egyptian, you know, his uh, Egyptian feelings in the Greek uh, uh, he used. I, I mean, it is harder for you if you are not original to the language, of course. I know like uh, E.M. Shoran, he's uh, a, a Romanian philosopher who migrated to Paris and became one of the great stylists in the French language. He said, I choose the words word by word, you know. Uh, it's not the other, you, uh, the, the w in your own language, it just comes, you, you are writing. There is, uh, I you have an instinct for the language. With this one, you don't really have an instinct. You have to search. So in a way, there is a freshness in it. I mean, you see, you know, uh, 
things in, in, in a different way. I used to play back uh, boggle, you know, the, the, the word game boggle with, uh, with my wife's family. And the, my wife is from uh, Connecticut. And they are very, you know, all very well educated uh, people. And uh, I used to win, you know. Uh, I mean, here I'm, you know, coming from outside. And uh, they said, oh, w you win, you know, because you see words there we don't see, you know, because you are not uh, native to the language. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there, is the, there are advantages also because, uh, uh, you know, because, uh, because uh, it's fresh. Uh, uh, of course, there is a danger that you might uh, overestimate the meaning of words. But I think with a lot of reading and sensi sensitivity to words and to what is said and to situation, you develop uh, that. The English was so poetic. I mean, I just thought it was so descriptive. And I, whenever I hear Arabic poetry, it's such a such a strong visual. And in English, I experienced that through your poems. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know uh, what is his name? Uh, Beckett. You know, uh, he wrote in French. He wrote three plays in French, and he said, uh, kind of, he said uh, he described the English language as this terrible language that I still know, you know, <laughs> he said. <laughs> uh, so, and here, uh, the whole world is writing in English in this terrible language, what can you do? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Arabic is supposed, I mean, yeah, I understand. I think part of it is when I started writing, really, uh, the, the Arabic language uh, has evolved poetically to capture the, the everyday. I think like people like Nazar Kabbali and, you know, and Darwish, it took a while for the language to become really uh, adapted to, to, the, to the present, you know, that you can buy a sandwich in a poem, you know, uh, or, or hang the clothes. It wasn't like this. I mean, it probably it was like this in the pre-Islamic poetry where they were talking about daily life. But then there was a period when it became really different. I mean, you know, like if you read Adonis, for instance, his poetry is very neoclassical. It's not like, uh, you know, daily uh, stuff. It is not, it is not like Darwish's language or, or, or um, uh, Nazar Khabbali, Ala al maqaidi ba'dun min sagairihi, you know, uh, just really talking about, yeah. so. That is, uh, you know, I, I said you, uh, there is no satisfactory answer. Uh, what was the other about? Uh, yeah, really the, the lines where uh, the prophet died and the just the olive tree didn't, you know, uh, shed the leaves because obviously they don't, right? Uh, and when uh, when uh, the God asked her, in 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 in, in here, I mean, w I have an angel, but there was no angel there in the story. Uh, uh, when the angel, I mean the God asked, why are you doing this? And she said, I just burn green. I burn inside. You know, I don't have to show off. And that was the story. And the rest I made up. Uh, I enjoyed actually doing the angel, you know, I mean, uh, uh, so... Uh, and we don't think a lot about angels in Islamic. I think it's more a Christian thing. And I tried to kind of make up this angel here. It was fun, you know, to, to do an angel. I have one more question about your poems. Like the prophet himself is Muslim. No, my grandmother is Muslim, so she... W but I, I don't really, you know, I mean, in, in Palestinian uh, poetry, you find, I mean, like I have, I have uh, poems. Uh, I wrote a poem uh, out of Egypt. It's a kind of like dialogue with out of Egypt in the in the Bible, you know, in chapter six of, uh, uh, yeah, because uh, so the, the it doesn't really matter. I mean, the prophet, the prophet, uh, uh, the, the because in Islam anyway, they are all prophets. Isa is a prophet, and Moses is, is a prophet, so it doesn't really matter. Maryam Qasim Saad, poet. I, I hope 
uh, if you do have, if you wrote any poems in Arabic, it would be so nice to do the closure with a poem of yours in Arabic, if you have it. If you, uh, if you don't, I want to thank you very much. That was lovely and very reflective, your readings and your productions and your books and your sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't really, I don't, I should have translated one, you know, but I, I don't write it. Uh, yeah. Huh? Yeah, well, I mean, it's all right. I'm, I live, you know, I live here, right? So, and uh, really th the poetry is, is, is bailiness. The way you talk, the way you, the way, uh, you know, you want to say I, I had to buy a sub uh, in the poem, right? And it is hard. To, to, to say it in, in Arabic if you are here. Wakuntu uh, sabba, you know. It's, uh, it doesn't really, uh, uh, it doesn't matter. The, the hardest, however, I, uh, you know, the hardest part, of course, uh, is, is uh, really uh, uh, the culture, you know, how you transmit the culture through the, the poetry. You know, I mean, here my grandmother is talking, you know, burning green. Does it work in, in, in English or not? I mean, it, it has to work somehow, you know, because, uh, but, but, but really it is the culture that is the, the problem. And at the end of the day, this is what I say. Do I really, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, do subtitles of myself in these poems? You don't really know whether you succeed, you don't, uh, whether you're, these are your feelings, but this is how they come. And uh, it's for uh, other people to really judge. I mean, you don't write your poems really for you. I mean, you hope that people will uh, read them and they, it, they, it, they will move them and they will move, the, uh, they will move other people differently than they moved you, you know, I mean, uh, because each one comes with his own or her own baggage, you know. So. I would like you to say a little bit more about the first part of your talk, circles of exile. And I was wondering when you said circles of exile, are they sort of regional, you know, some people inside Palestine who feel exiled, some people who are outside, some people who are in the Arab world, some people in America, or is it like the circles of the inferno of Dante, you know? The, the more you go down, the worse it is. And in what circle you feel you are? Uh, if, if, they, if you can give them names, these circles. You probably, uh, yeah, I didn't really think of uh, Dante's circles, you know, but, but obviously there are, that can be uh, done that way. Maybe they are not all as hellish, you know, as Dante. I mean, that would be uh, probably, uh, the most. In any case, uh, the the anthology itself, you know, doesn't really have enough like representation. It is not as it were a representative sample of poets. You know, like we don't have anyone like from Jordan writing it, or from Kuwait, or from Saudi Arabia, or from Libya, or from so it's mostly f uh, from the West Bank and from uh, the West from England and from the United States. Uh, so I, you could, I couldn't really uh, do the whole thing, you know. But I know uh, from both, you know, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, qu the question comes in basically, uh, of course, is language and culture. Because if you are, are you, if you are an exile in Sweden, you know, are you really like a Palestinian exile in Jordan? It's not, right? I mean, in the culture, uh, you are eating the same food, it is the same language. Nonetheless, you know, I mean, you are still th thinking of yourself as a refugee and an exile, and you are seeking Palestine, uh, etc. But, but the way you write, you write differently uh, about it. Uh, uh, you can write about, uh, I mean, like, look at Darwish, you know, he wrote poems about every Arab capital, right? 
he wrote about uh, the Tunis, about uh, Baghdad, about Cairo, about uh, all, all, all these. So because you, you feel at home there more. I mean, not totally at home because no one makes you feel at home. Even in Egypt, you know, you don't. Uh, the Egyptians are such, you know, hospitable people, but every day you are asked, where are you from? You know, and then you have to answer, you know, where you are from. Uh, so there, there is that. But when I, uh, like in, 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 in my manuscript, you know, from Cairo, I could easily say, you know, we, you know, I talk as an Egyptian. We, this and that, we do not have a bicycle lanes, you know, in one of the towns. I say, uh, uh, I can't remember the line, but, but it's kind of red colored uh, bicycle lanes, uh, wine colored uh, bicycle lanes. And I, the whole poem is about us, you know. And I could uh, imagine myself uh, an Egyptian and could be, you know, uh, have uh, th this kind of empathy, total empathy. I mean, of course, I, you know, could write about a pigeon and uh, as, as if I was the pigeon, but empathy is very important for poetry. It's the first thing. You have to be empathetic. If you're not empathetic, you really can't uh, write poetry. And empathy is basically putting yourself in the other person's or animal's shoes, right? So uh, over there, uh, the culture is different. So you are working with the material, you know, uh, that you have uh, in there. Uh, uh, there is no alienation in, in, one in that sense. I mean, here you have alienation uh, in different ways. Uh, we have the uh, alienation of the media all the time the alienation of people, you know, I mean, uh, if you talk in Jordan, everyone knows where Palestine is. And so it's not really a big uh, deal, actually. It, it may be even harder to write about Palestine in Jordan than here, because everyone knows, you know, what you're talking about. And you have then to come up with something, you know, more interesting, you know, than, uh, than the n uh, daily thing. Uh, so there are, uh, I think this is really a, a topic that w would be really good to, to, to explore further, but through the work of more people. Uh, the, the sample here uh, isn't uh, sufficient, I think, to, to reach uh, conclusions. But these are my preliminary thoughts. Thank you uh, very much, Sharif. Thank you. Thank you. As, as I mentioned, we, we invite you to, to join us in the room in, in the back where we have the, uh, the books uh, available uh, for, for purchase, both Seeking Palestine and, and Flawed Landscape as the well. I, I should add, the, the contributors, you know, and uh, my own book, we don't make any money out of this. All the money goes uh, to Palm Fest, you know, the Palestinian Literary Festival. In, uh, in Ramallah every year. That's organized by Ahdaf Suif, the Egyptian writer Ahdaf Suif. So we, we, this is not, uh, we, uh, the publishers, you know, of course, uh, do make money, but we don't. So a great book and a great cause. Thank you. Thank you very much.